Hi there, everyone, and welcome to another Talking Bat interview for Batability Club. And wow, we're actually doing two Talking Bats today for the price of one because we've got two marvellous guests. First of all, we've got Sherwood Snyder, and with Sherwood today, we've got Paul Howden Leach. Paul's actually making his second appearance on Batability Club. He was a Be Your Guest talking about Kaleidoscope software earlier in 2021. How are you doing, Paul? All right? I'm not bad. I'm glad you actually came up with a date of 2021 because it could have been any time in the last two years because I've no idea what's happened in the last two years. <laughs> but, but yeah, I'm, I'm in the same room. I've not left, not, not left no. the building for two years. But um, apart from that, yeah, doing good. Doing good. How's you? I'm doing good. And thanks for coming back. And Sherwood, this is your first time on Batability Club. How are you today? I'm good, except I, I finished my um, my Zoom beverage prematurely, so hopefully it's in the bloodstream. <laughs> so, so uh, Sherwood, you're on uh, just outside New York, is that right? Or have I got that totally wrong? Where, where are you based? Um, I'm in upstate New York, so um, Ithaca is the town. It's kind of home of Cornell University and not that much else, so it's kind of a liberal island in a sea of upstate New York. Okay. Uh, but the company is based in um, everyone other than Paul and I and a couple others is based in Massachusetts. Right. OK. Wow. Wow. And what time is it in New York at the moment? Sure. I actually have to look because there's this absurd thing. I could talk for an hour about daylight savings time, but it wouldn't be a pleasant conversation. It's, it's 1020, but really it's 1120. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, uh, just, just to make people aware of why uh, Sherwood's mentioning that, it's because over the last couple of days, we've been having a debate as to what time it is in the UK relative to what time it is in Eastern states. And to complicate matters worse, I'm actually in France at the moment. So mm -hmm. between myself, Paul and Sherwood, we're in three different time zones, I think. So uh, yeah, right. you're good to get going, guys. Yeah, you're good to yeah. get going. Apart from the Zoom lag, we're fine. <laughs> <laughs> so today, what we're going to talk about is, uh, well, I want to get a little bit more in behind these two characters, and I'm going to call them characters uh, because they definitely are characters. They pop up quite regularly at back conferences and online and doing training sessions. They talk a lot about bats and bat detectors and stuff like that. But we're going to go a little bit deeper, a little bit deeper, a little bit more behind the scenes behind uh, these gentlemen, and also a little bit more behind the scenes with wildlife acoustics. And apart from that, of course, it wouldn't be fair, it wouldn't be appropriate. In fact, it wouldn't be proper for us to do a Talking Bat interview without at least talking about some of the products that Sherwood and Paul are involved with, uh, you know, selling, promoting, demonstrating, etc. But before we do any of that, a little bit about these guys. So Sherwood is Director of Product Development and Paul is UK Business Development Consultant. So Sherwood, first of all, what does a Director of Product Development at Wildlife Acoustics do? Um, it's a job of herding cats. <laughs> Mostly, um, it's a uh, it's the it's the I consider it the sort of creative part of um, product from ideation to development to wait that doesn't make sense recursive loop um, to uh, this is a product that people want to making the product and so it kind of um, in in my mind it involves the sort of gestalt of what's out there and what somebody might need that's not out there. Um, sometimes people do the job for me and just ask for something. Other yeah. times you have to kind of decide what somebody didn't know was technically possible to ask for. And so then it's the, the guiding and kind of shepherding of that idea into a, a product and then working with sales and marketing and others to uh, get it out into the world. Wow, wow. I'm not going to talk a little bit, well, we're going to talk a lot more about the process um, you know, late, later on, because, you know, I'm, as you'll know, and as I suspect I know, it takes a lot of hard work to visualize an idea, scribble it down first time on a bit of paper, 
from that moment through to uh, having an actual product to sell, that could take a lot, it's an awful lot of hard work and an awful long time. Yeah. 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 Paul, what does the UK business development consultant for wildlife acoustics do, or what are you supposed to do? <laughs> well, obviously, it's, it's one of those job titles where I could do anything, really. But I, yeah. I suppose um, what I'm trying to do is to bridge the gap between um, kind of the technical side of things and um, the ecology side, side of things. So I'm a consultant anyway, so I do back work. So I'm kind of used to that ridiculous thing of going out and staying out all night and watching bats and kind of don't tell anyone but quite enjoying it from time to time you know that sort of thing the dawn surveys I could probably give a miss but yeah. kind of having um an understanding of how bat surveys are undertaken and carried out and keeping my finger on the pulse of that I can be uh, almost like an advisor to say going back to wildlife acoustics look this is what's happening now in the world of bats this is the next requ requirement I mean for instance um, there's been a lot of talk on um, you probably talked about this quite a lot on sort of infrared technology and uh, a lot of cameras that's the next thing that's coming into that wildlife acoustics I'm not going to rule it out say that you, you know, nothing planned to build cameras um, but the idea of that information being fed back and this is where the interest the the, the um, the industry is moving to is kind of what I'm kind of dealing with. But also, as it says, UK uh, business development consultant, it's, it's developing the business. It's watching it expand and grow. And it's not just in UK, it's Europe and Asia and Africa and everywhere else. So um, it's kind of a little bit broader. I think the UK is there because I'm based in the UK. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, and of course it gives, I suppose it gives wildlife acoustics uh, you know, someone in a different part of the planet, because I would imagine Sherwood, it's, it's probably relatively easy to keep a handle on what's going on in North America, but other parts of the world, maybe not as easy. Would that be a fair assumption, Sherwood? Yeah, I mean, um, Paul has provided a feedback loop, um, not just from different parts of the world, but from like a working um, bat ecologist before he was actually hired. So now he's just actually getting paid for it. <laughs> good, good, good. Right. I'm getting paid. Right. <laughs> there you go. The checks in the post, Paul. We, we like kept that. Paul's title intentionally vague because um, Paul is a versatile guy and like it wasn't in his job description, like get us on the BBC all the time and stuff. <laughs> we, right. we don't want to paint him into a corner and inhibit his natural abilities. <laughs> excellent stuff, excellent stuff. So outside of work, uh, Sherwood, tell me, you appear to be burning down some perfectly good habitat here. What's what's this? Are you, uh, no, have you dropped a match or something? What's going yeah, on that's, there? Yeah, that's the neighbor's yard. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that's my um, scorched earth hobby. Uh, basically I'm taking about, um, about 15 acres I have in upstate New York here, which when I inherited it was nothing but um, invasive Japanese honeysuckle and the few things that like survived that mess. And so um, I'm a little bit bird obsessed and I'm very bird obsessed with birds that show up in my yard. Like I think they're mine and stuff. Like I think I own them. <laughs> so I want to attract others and so um, I've been I've been pretty hardcore spending the maybe to an unhealthy amount of time and money in um, turning that very homogenous habitat into a meadow, which involves burning lots of honeysuckle. Um, there's no laws here in New York. <laughs> uh, um, turning that into a meadow, I put in a pond, um, I put in a marsh, uh, just you know a more varied habitat so that i can attract and stare at more birds i figure it's good for them but it's also good for me because it's my uh it's very therapeutic for me to go into those back acres and hunt some birdies so okay I spend and, a lot of uh, are, are you on any migration routes there have you attracted anything of particular yeah. interest yeah there's a there's a up in upstate new york there's something called the finger lakes because they look like fingers they're pretty long and and large and deep lakes so um, they're no more than a couple miles away from me. So if you put a little body of uh, water that's visible from the sky, I do get the advantage of um, that, that southern tip of Cuyahoga Lake, which is just a little north of me, is a big migration route. And so sometimes if it gets a little crowded down there, I 
catches the eye of somebody flying over, I get probably more birds than I than I deserve, kind of based on that little route there. Bye, bye, bye. But I, but I do have a, a very, it's, um, I've, I have, with my own eye, I've seen about 110 species of birds on the property. So it's already a pretty varied habitat. But at this point, in order to attract more birds to my list, um, I have to spend money. <laughs> <laughs> I've just got visions of lots of peanut feeders suspended. From... <laughs> yeah, well, there's a tractor, you know. Ah, oh, right. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds good. Sounds good. Right, yeah. Paul, what the blesses is going on here, Paul? Oh, geez. Uh, right, yeah. So I, I, this is not my usual get up. I don't. Um, so I play in a band and this was actually for a festival and it's a little tiny family festival there's only about 500 people in it and we were one of the bands but it's themed each year and this was uh, carnival or the circus basically and so everyone has to go dressed up as something from the circus so this is not how i usually like rock on stage as it were <laughs> this is not not me i mean you've delved into into sort of things to find that definitely that's um yeah you're, we're both lucky about like Neil could have cropped out that guitar. I know, and I know. And, you're a clown, and he could have cropped mine a little bit, so I just looked like some sort of Amish Satan. So <laughs> we're lucky that he gave some context. Yeah, yeah. He's only got the. He's only got. I mean, is it my guitar? I mean, that's the other thing. Yeah, uh, that, 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 that is your guitar. I'm pretty confident that was your guitar. Yeah, definitely, definitely. It's a Fender. Is it a Fender Strat? No, it is. It is. Yeah, okay. Right. Uh, uh, for anybody watching this, there's three guitar geeks uh, on here. Right. So at any point, this could wander off into a guitar talk rather than that. <laughs> uh, the, the, the only difference is you guys can play. Okay. I mean, I'm. Uh, it's been it's been a long, long time since I've uh, played properly. I just strum along now. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, what's the name of the band, uh, Paul? Oh, we, we're called Kingfisher Blue. Yeah, and that's very apt because I've got a picture of a kingfisher there. Oh. Which, to be fair, I think I took off of the kingfisher blue Facebook page. Okay. Oh, did you? <laughs> yeah, I don't know where you guys got it, but I, I will thought. Have it. Wait <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Multiple infringements happening. Here. Oh yes. <laughs> but you don't get the species of kingfisher in the uh, northeastern <laughs> United States, Sherwood. Is that right? No. Um, no, I get a belted kingfisher, which does does visit my my pond with some frequency but wow. there is uh, there's a bone i've got to pick with sherwood on this Go because the last time he came over to the uk he said i want to do some oh. birding and uh we i said okay well wh where do you fancy going he'd been to a few places beforehand and we went to carsington water which is kind of just in the edge of the peat district and we went into the first bird hide and within we hadn't even set up and a kingfisher went straight past seriously Oh, I, I've seen about five in my life, and then yeah. that was it. So, no. yeah, it was like four Vincent. feet away from our eyeballs. <laughs> it really was. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, kingfisher. You've got to be. You kind of got to be well in the UK anyway. You can't just you can't just turn up and say, "Oh, we're definitely going to see a kingfisher." You know, it's you know, uh, very few sites you can do that. And, and but, the annoying thing was because um, it was calling, so I was trying to record some birds whilst I was there and I got a little shotgun mic and everything else and I hadn't set it up and it went past me. Oh, oh, oh. Gone. That's, that's annoying. That is frustrating. That is frustrating. <laughs> but but Sherwood would have had one of his song meter micros or something tucked in his pocket or whatever. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I just had binoculars and cameras. I was in a whole different mode. <laughs> right. Let's move on. Let's move on. Um, I was fascinated Sherwood when you sent me this picture over the weekend and I want you to tell me a little bit about what we're looking at here and why it's significant yeah well that um that is my first thoughts on what a echometer touch user interface would look like um which isn't how the echo you know this is already down the road of product ideation a little bit. Um, you know, first it's the idea, and then it's the um, it convincing others at work. Uh, the the echometer touch was a more difficult convincing job, just because. Hey, I think that we could make a thing that just plugs in, and this was, I mean, it wasn't early in the smartphone days, but 
they're so part of like, you know, younger people don't realize that in like 2010, it was still like a new thing. Only like nerds had smartphones and it wasn't just this ubiquitous, like $99 thing in your pocket. So, you know, the notion that, and we had a handheld detector, the, the EM3, and it had a little spectrogram display on it. And so the notion that you could build a thing to plug into iPhones and that anybody would actually want that, um, you know, at least one member of staff laughed. <laughs> I went home early and drew this. <laughs> um, and uh, the, the actual inspiration for this was um, a, a, a deaf woman had um, emailed us asking if there was some way that she could get a signal out of a song meter that would tell her when a bat was flying by because the, those early song meters had a little headphone jack and you could hear um, the bat flying by through some technology. And that was a great way to check everything was working and she couldn't use that. So she's like, could you blink a light or whatever? So um, she happened to be an early iPhone user as well, I found out. And so I found this like spectrogram app that costs like 99 cents, it was really crappy. But you could plug a one eighth to one eighth into the song meter, it would take that signal out and you could see it on this blurry little spectrogram. And that was like delightful and exciting. Um, and then I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like it, it was like, um, you know, th that could be a beautiful thing. And so once I convinced everybody at work that this was a viable plan, because, you know, you got to take that seriously. It's uh, our, our process at Wildlife Acoustics is pretty informal of um, someone has an idea and, and you know, we're, we're not a public company. Uh, our, our boss owner, um, most owner Ian Agranat is, um, you know, somebody that I just go to and I'm, I have this idea and we hash through it and hopefully he gets excited about it. And if he doesn't, I just keep bothering him about it for years. <laughs> and, um, and then eventually we make the product. If it's successful, um, I take all the credit. If it's not, I say it's a team effort. Um, <laughs> and so the, we started developing this and um, we had, we contracted different people that had expertise and, you know, just, we have a lot of engineers and stuff in house, but this is very specific, like talking to an Apple product and all that. Um, the, the echo meter touch isn't just a, a microphone. It, it digitizes the sound and turns it into ones and zeros in the device and, you know, transmits that through a communication protocol to the iPhone. So that was like a big technical hurdle to get over. So we started developing it. What you're, looking at in the second image there was the first time little baby took a step. Um, that was the first spectrogram of a bat. Um, I think the team working on it, like open champagne, they're like, we did it. Sherwood's going to love this. Um, and I, I, I'm, I strive for perfection until Ian cuts off my funds. I guess that's how I could describe the process. And so we spent after that, image there, I want to say months, just not perfecting the look of the spectrogram, but I wanted this sort of Steve Jobs magic that everybody has become acclimated to. Like when you scroll, it doesn't go at the speed of your finger. It, there's like acceleration. This is stuff that's all built into Apple, but we couldn't use the built-in stuff. We couldn't just call the magical accelerated scroll thing because that's not made for a bat spectrogram. So we had to fake it all. And, you know, this is a team of not many people trying to fake something done by a company with 200,000 employees. So, you know, the Zoom and how all of that flows, I was just really, really, really annoying about it. Um, and I'm very proud of how, when you use the Echometer Touch, I don't think anybody's ever come up to me and said, um, man, your team just absolutely nailed the scrolling and the Zooming. It, it just, it seemed like it was just something we called from Apple. And so I take yeah. that like as some sort of pride of success that no one's patted me on the back for how that spectrogram acts. But it was like having that like real feel of like not glitchiness and not I scroll it and then it refreshes. I wanted that so bad because that's part of the appeal is being on this iPhone platform is I got to app world. Okay. And once you're in app world, you can do anything. If, if, uh, a customer um, has a great idea for you that you can steal and call your own. That's not a new button membrane or a new mold, or it's just an it's just a adding a thing to the app. And so, 
um, as soon as you're in app world, like it's almost too much. There's just too, there's so many possibilities. You have to get picky. You have to reject a lot of people so it doesn't become too bloated and confusing. And um, you, you have to really continue to think outside the box. Um, example being after all of this was implemented, um, I'm like, well, geez, this thing is a computer. Can we just steal Kaleidoscope? You know, at the time we charged $1,500 for Kaleidoscope. So yeah. stealing it and sticking it in this app for free took some convincing as well, but it ran like in real time. Bat flies by, auto identification, it suggests what species it thinks it is. And then as soon as that happened, I was like, well, my God, I can't just put big brown on here. Um, the, the picture you see there, it's suggesting big brown or silver hair. Um, we got to that point and I was like, well, God, shouldn't it be a photo? <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> when that like really showed off. And so then I spent, you know, I, I had to then win over Merlin Tuttle, who has these beautiful, beautiful portraits of every bat in North America. And huh. none of them are looking rabid or um, they're just they're they're like little kings and queens they're regal and they're beautiful and yeah. i wanted to show that because one of the big sorry i i you tell me when to stop talking <laughs> no no you, you keep going you keep going i, I find this fascinating i'll warn you um one of the big challenges with this product was that we were trying to hit this like kind of price point where it would be like my god i can get that for depending on the model two or three hundred dollars and it will do everything a much more expensive detector might do our own included at the same time finally be cheap enough that certainly in the uk kind of hobbyists would buy it and then the ultimate hope was that it would be inexpensive enough that the this doesn't really exist in the us but we're like well maybe it just doesn't have a reason to exist so to kind of get that kind of hobbyist uh, market going in the united states and so in my mind that means it's going to end up in the hands of maybe novices or children and so i want a merlin tuttle picture so yeah um yeah. i i i convinced merlin tuttle you know he was he was so um um aware of of how it could be misused and how you know if you just flash up a picture of a merlin tuttle bat um somebody will be like oh cool it's it's an eastern red bat and you're like no 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 yeah. We're suggesting it might be based on the acoustics and stuff. And so this is an example of somebody else doing my job for me. He suggested that um, it people will intuitively understand that it's not a sure auto identification if you show the second place bat. Yeah. And so yeah. that was to to um, make Merlin comfortable with the technology and let us use his photos. That's why it shows the second place bat. And he's like totally right, but yeah. I hadn't yeah. thought of it. <laughs> Yeah. No, 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 I totally get that, totally get that. And uh, wow. So when, when you go to the boss with an idea, yeah? yeah. Uh, and I've, I've been a boss in the past, okay, with a team of people that have ideas and uh, not, not, not to the scale that you guys do. And they'll come to me with an idea. And the first thing I will say to them is no. <laughs> <laughs> and then the second thing I will say to them is give me a cost benefit analysis behind that idea and then we'll maybe talk about it uh, does it kind of go like that or is it kind of like um, just positivity right from the very start and yeah then or is that I, a bit I guess both? I, I, yeah. I should elaborate I mean um, I have good ideas sometimes. The Echometer Touch is an example. The boss also has good ideas sometimes, but more often than not, um, we and others just kind of see which way the winds are blowing and the product is almost obvious as a response. Yeah. And so it's not um, so one way as um, I'm the guy that thinks up stuff and goes to Ian with it. Um, it's, 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 it's usually this sort of like literally there's been products where Ian and I are on the phone talking about something else and we start talking about it and pretty soon there's a whiteboard involved and pretty soon a product was just accidentally born. And then if we're excited enough about it, and when I say we, I don't just mean him and I, like, you know, the, you know, the snowball effect of like, it just like happens. It, um, so, you know, there, there was no form ever filled out where requesting funds and showing the, 
you know, cost benefit analysis. Um, it's something I very much appreciate about wildlife acoustics is okay. um, yeah. while trying to be responsible with our money and we are, um, we understand that kind of in this niche business or designing something that doesn't exist like the Echometer Touch, it would be sometimes you have to go with your gut and um, take a leap of faith and you don't have to be right every time. Yeah. You have to be right enough to pay all of the paychecks and the development of future products. But yeah. in my opinion, and shared by Ian, I mean, if you're going to try to be right every time, it's going to be pretty damn boring. It's um, it's yeah. it's that you 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 have that stifles creativity. And um, Ian has let me go off and fail. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> not fail, but, you know, um, you know, there's some things that make business sense and there's some things that make less business sense. There's some things that pay more of a percent of the paycheck, but there's other things that deserve to exist just because they're awesome or they get people excited or they help vats or, you know, we have multitudes of reasons. You can't just have the profit makers, um, but you do need profit in order to run a, a, a company where, you have this growing number of employees and const the development is expensive of everything. I mean, I could yeah. go into it ad nauseum what every mold and machining and prototype costs, but I think often it adds up to more money than, than some of our customers might realize. Yeah, and Paul, from, from this side of the Atlantic, uh, it must be pretty exciting for you to be involved in a company that's uh, involved in all this kind of stuff, I mean, it, 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 well, I think that <clears throat> there, there is always this thing of there's, you know, there's a, a product that's been, being launched. Um, people can and know it's coming. You know, there's always like a there's a period of time where wildlife acoustics haven't done anything for a while or there's nothing new that's that's appeared. And then they, they think, well, something must be coming. There's usually an announcement that we are doing something. And then I get a little box uh, thrown on my desk. So this is one here. And this is not a it's not it's not product placement, but I, I want to show you something. That this is the one of the first ones off the production line. This is number five. Okay. Yeah. So I've got the fifth. Wait, what number is mine? <laughs> 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 so so it's quite nice. You've got something in your hand here that you're in effect testing because you are yeah. testing it. You're making sure it works and everything else, even though it's gone through a regular testing. But mine's kind of the, not the afterthought testing, that's probably the wrong way of describing it, but it's, I go out and use it in the real world. This is before they've kind of been sold. So when we say it's fifth on the production line, it's kind of a small run and we go yeah. and get it in people's hands and really get it um, get it out there to see if it's got any flaws, anything wrong, you know, everything else like that. And then I can give feedback on that. And, and seeing that feedback then go back into the product is, is actually wonderful. It's a really nice thing to see and because like Sherwood says a lot of this is app land mm -hmm. um then app land means I, I can say oh can you put a gps on this and can it do this and can it you know and and we can actually get we can change its functionality uh, a lot more i mean i think um when i haven't got one on my desk but when the the mini bat came out um it had a gps to sort of like put it in a specific location but it can now do transex so you just leave it on your phone, touches the roof of your car, and off you go around on a on a transect, and then it, it'll plot all that. And it's like, well, that's something that's developed, but it's the same box, but yeah, it's yeah. developed because of that app one. So yeah. um, I quite enjoy this element, and I mean, obviously, Sherwood and I talk, and uh, Ian and lots of other people in the in the organisation, we kind of like know the new the new toy that's been thought about, and we get consulted. You know, do you think it's a good idea? And and you can actually say no. You know, I think it's terrible yeah. idea, and give your reasons, and you won't get fired. Well, we yeah. haven't been fired yet. Yes. <laughs> arguments can happen at Wildlife Acoustics without firing. It's it's um. Yeah something that it's 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 like fruitful uh debate <laughs> happens yeah yeah and no it doesn't <laughs> <laughs> it's degree <laughs> so um, look, I, look, look uh, uh, this is something i've got to ask you about okay uh no, but there, there are, i've got i've got an em touch pro all right so okay so i've, I've got the product i've used the product I think it's an amazing bat detector. I've told people that many times, eh, but there's there are two things in particular that regularly come up here. And I just wonder, eh, since we're talking about it, to give yourselves the chance to 
uh, explain or counter uh, the two points I'm going to make. Wait, I, okay. I got to I got to interrupt you. Is there anything you want to say about the spectrogram before you get into that? It's anything marvelous. about how it flows and zooms? It's amazing. <laughs> I love it. Okay. <laughs> I absolutely love it. Go who, on. Who, 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 whoever did that, whoever came up with that idea and put the genius. hard work into that, a genius. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for talking <laughs> 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 Paul, yeah, you're going to say something? Or... No, 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 no. no. Okay. Right, so the first thing is, now, you've designed this detector that has to attach to a multitude of different devices made by a range of different manufacturers, so not just Apple, but all of the Android devices. And the, the connection dependent upon the device uh, can be a bit flimsy yeah what, what's your thoughts on that Sherwood I mean that that must be such a difficult thing such such a difficult challenge bearing in mind the size of the USB-C connector or whatever that you've got to play with but have you had much heartache over that from a product development point of view um I have a lot of heartache over Android in general <laughs> <laughs> So the, the, the first generation of Echometer Touch, the EMT1, was a little anodized aluminum thing, and yeah. um, it was it was Apple only. Um, and yeah. at that time, there was maybe three or four Apple devices. Um, later, Apple started making multitudes of sizes of screens, and it's like a just keeps coming, coming. So it became more challenging, but still always the same connector. Yeah. The, extremely strict quality control from Apple about how that connector fits. Um, I mean, literally we, our very first Echometer Touch was rejected by Apple. We were not allowed to sell it as an official Apple MFI authorized seller uh, because around the lightning connector, if you looked at it, there yeah. was this tiny little gap. Okay. It was beyond their spec. We had to print a special little gasket to stick over there. I mean, super specific, but and nightmarish to deal with. Um, however, it did result in a great fit and a nice, uh, um, you know, yeah. they're, they're taking care of, a, they're worrying about a product experience. Um, Android, um, there is no such thing. Yeah, no, okay. no Google check of, is this a good product, a bad product, a working product, does it fit? Um, and then as you described the absolute multitude of devices as a product becomes more successful, the user base grows, the headache grows, um, everybody wants it to work on their phone, both in terms of physical contact and the phone having enough horsepower and RAM and, yeah, um, yeah. you know, um, the right technologies to run, you know, nobody wants to buy a new phone for it. They already spent, you know, 100, 200, 300 pounds for it or whatever. So, um, yeah, it's, it's a headache and one that you can't there's there's no way to make a product that's going to work with every android phone there's also no way to make one that's going to fit perfectly in every android phone because uh, you don't get to i trust apple that the lightning connector on every apple device is going to be rock solid i just okay. i trust that to be true it is absolutely not true on android you can have phones with literally you know the female connector is wobbly you can have phones with usb so suddenly you need an adapter from the micro usb to the usb so it's yeah. something that we try to improve where we can and we're, we're not done improving that product and making it fit better with phones that are are current and you might hear more about that in the coming months but um it's it's definitely it's the reason it's a headache is because you can't always control it you just sometimes have to tell someone like we can't make it work with your phone um, yeah. or tell someone like you know if it's a little wobbly there's nothing our product isn't wobbly it's it's your android phone so um, we <laughs> yeah. keep a, a long list on the on the um, website of of phones that are compatible with it at some point i tried to keep track based on customer reactions what was compatible or not and then uh, i think it was about uh, so maybe it's two years ago now. I'm in the same time warp of the rest of us are in. Um, we actually added a little survey to the Android app. So if you make enough recordings using the Android app, that's the kind of metric we use to decide that you're a frequent user of it. I don't, okay. I don't remember what the number is, 20 or 50. If you do that, there'll be a little pop-up that says, hey, you mind taking this one minute survey? Okay. Um, and it basically asks, um, it already knows what your phone is because it can get that from the, the operating system. It asks um, specific questions, you know, does your spec, is, is there glitchiness in the recording? Does the auto ID work 
quickly. And so it asks these questions and then all those results and people are really kind about it. I mean, I get um, hundreds every month. So thousands and thousands of responses. And I take this big spreadsheet of the responses. I, you know, every few months I update it, I sort it and I only look for phones that reported perfect, 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 perfect. And by multiple people, then it deserves to get added to the compatibility list on our website. So it's a pretty rock solid compatibility list up there. We still will have people that email us and say, I have one on your list. It doesn't work. The fact of the matter is with success comes headaches. We have a big enough user base now that we run into people with broken phones. You know? okay. okay. I mean, like yeah. the, you know, yeah. the, the, yeah. the phone has been around the block, man. So yeah. even on our list, you know, things break. I, I can't, I can't guarantee everything, but I, we, I think we've, we've learned how to um, do the best we can. No, well, the, the other query uh, is, and again, I suppose it's the same. Okay. Because you're, you're dictated to by the, the phone and what's on the phone, but it's the battery life uh, issue, you know, that the phone runs out of battery life. Um, and, and of course the connector for the, for the device is the same as the connector for the charger. Um, yeah, I mean, any thoughts on that? I mean, again, are you just hands tied because the different this is, systems or this is this is uh, something came up actually and i i assured okay. this question about we would it was a, a bbc spring watch thing and what we wanted okay. was an emt microphone inside a maternity roost uh -huh. but we wanted the screen outside so okay. we could film the screen that was the idea but they wanted it to last forever they wanted it just to continually work right yeah and so the idea was to get the biggest screen possible i asked sherwood and he said it was just when the you know the kinetic ch charging had just sort of come in and right. he disappeared off and spent a large amount of time just googling i assume um and then found a tablet that would charge kinetically and would was on our list right okay it, it, it doesn't because as soon as as soon as it charges it disconnects that that um right. that port yeah. unfortunately so we couldn't do what the BBC wanted us to do, unfortunately, and it's just, um, I mean, sure, we'll talk about this a lot more, but I think if you're doing things for like a, a bit of a, a hobby, a bit of fun, you know, it's not, you're not relying on it, your phone is great because it's in your pocket, you know, but if yeah. you're trying to do something, you know, long term, the bigger the device, the bigger the battery, the, yeah. the longer it's going to last, uh, That that's that's what I always say, I mean, I tend to use, um, I use an iPad mini for nearly every one of my surveys, it always lasts long enough for me um but i do have one of the do you remember what it is sure it's like carrying a massive tv screen around with me is that yeah it's the iPad, ipad pro i think the 13 inch one you got yeah it's you it could kill a man with it it's like it's just <laughs> huge <laughs> you know and it lasts for something like if you turn the screen off it lasts for like nine hours or something ridiculous yeah, yeah. like that so um I'm sure she will go into more detail, but the, 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 the rule of thumb is the bigger it is, the longer it's going to last because it's going to have a bigger battery in there. So, yeah, yeah. Um, but I, I think the, the idea of, I mean, we know companies that have, um, they've got tablets for people, you know, but they've made sure that all their consultants have got a phone with the same connector as whatever tablet. So right. okay. if something goes wrong in the field, you've, you've always got a backup in your pocket. And that's, yes. that's great. Because if you forget your batteries with your handheld detector, then, just the same boat. Yeah, same boat. yeah, yeah. No, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Would you want to come in with with anything there? I mean, it's uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, to some extent, it is what it is. As Paul says, the the bigger the phone, the bigger the battery. Um, there is kind of like a diminishing returns. Um, but you know, like an iPad Mini will last several times longer than an iPhone. Um, it's just you know, the, the tablets are designed differently. They're designed for someone to, yeah. to use kind of more intently for longer periods of time. Um, I have tried the wireless charging with any number of devices, including Apple devices. And it's like the charging circuit is shared between the lightning and the wireless circuit. So as soon as you go into wireless charging, it cuts off the, um, the device. So um, there is most of these devices now, you know, you can get these little battery packs for the field and stuff. And a more modern iPhone, it's sort of like a, you know, this is the, this is the electric car question, right? Um, 
uh, the, I don't know what to call it for a bat biologist. It's hours, hours anxiety instead of range anxiety. Um, <laughs> but, um, how Tesla's worked against it is to make a, a quick charge feature where you can stop at a Tesla charging and it'll go up to 80% in 30 minutes or 60 minutes or whatever. And most iPhones actually have that same kind of feature now. Um, if you're willing to take a 30 minute break in the field and eat a sandwich, it'll go yeah. back up 80% in that time. So, um, you know, if certainly if I could design a phone that had a separate power input, um, I would do so. But there's just no way around the um, big variation between from tablets to an iPod touch. It's, yeah. you know, from two hours to 12 hours. Yeah, but it's yeah. something we're aware of. And as no, we no, develop no. products in the future, um, battery life could be addressed in different ways. And, and of course, you can always do things as the phone user or the tablet user. You could always uh, do things like uh, turn off uh, yeah. the other features on the phone that you're not going to be using, uh, turn down the brightness of the screen. Uh, somebody suggested uh, go into flight mode. That kind of stuff, all of that's going to give you more battery life, I think. Is what, that correct? What, yeah. The, the, the flight mode thing will turn off the GPS, so you'll lose the GPS. But, okay. but there's a really cool thing. I don't know if I've got one on my desk. I don't. I, I, um, I Garmin almost made it into it, but I also don't have it by me. Gar Garmin had a little uh, GPS Bluetooth called a Garmin Glow. Okay. And if you attach that to your phone, it'll take the GPS from the Garmin Glow rather than your phone, so it doesn't okay. lose your phone battery. So that that was the that, and it lasts for hours and hours. And hours. I, I did a. I went to a conference in San Sebastian, the Basque, Basque country, yeah. and um, we did this uh, mammoth walk about 11 miles up a massive mountain as one of the, the, the highlights of the, of the trip sort of thing. And uh, I thought, I'll, I'll GPS it. The reason I know it's 11 miles, uh, I, I got the Garmin Glow out and I put it in a little pouch on my arm and then walked up the mountain and I got back down and my battery on my phone was at 85%. I mean, I wasn't recording right. that or anything, but yeah. it, it shows it doesn't touch your phone battery. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The, the GPS is the biggest draw. So if, if there's one thing you want to do to improve the battery life and can live without the cool track and tagging feature of the Echometer Touch, then it's turning the GPS off. It's kind of yeah. on by default. And if you want the best of both worlds, then it's another $99 for you. Um, the, the, the product Paul's describing will both offload the battery from the phone to the thing, but it's also um, a little more accurate than the GPS inside of depending on which phone you have, a lot more accurate. Um, okay. So it's kind of win-win if, if it's important for you to have that extra hours of battery life. Excellent, excellent. So that, that, I, just, I just wanted your take on all of that because I think it was uh, really, really important to, to, to get a perspective from you guys, okay? Um, and thank you for that. And of course, as well as the software on phone, you've got the Kaleidoscope software with all of its marvelous uh, features, the cluster analysis, the, the automated classifiers and all the rest of it. Um, did you have much involvement with this, Sherwood, or was this something that existed? Um, what, what was your involvement with, with the software on Kaleidoscope? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Um, I was as sort of a, Kaleidoscope was sort of a response to um, wanting to provide our customers um, a software product of our own. So early on when we started designing batch detectors, we had no analysis software. And of course there's others that make um, great analysis software, but um, the, uh, the compatibility, it's sort of like the same reason Apple kind of likes to um, provide you hardware and software. It, the notion was that the software, if we had our own, um, we could both try to use our own you know, uh, learn skills to improve upon what exists, but also to make sure to always have that compatibility and support that's important to us. Um, it, it's sort of like you end up the fall, if you sell someone a bat detector and they go and buy software from someone, there's something not working right. If they don't get the kind of support they want from the software manufacturer, it's still your fault. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Um, this was a way to provide something all in house that we could always make sure to provide that kind of support um, and compatibility. And also it was a way to leverage some of the technologies we already had. Um, Ian actually started the company with a, a bird song recognition device. Yeah. Yeah. So he'd actually been thinking about pattern recognition and things like that since 2002 or 2003. So it was a way to kind of get some of that stuff um, into, into a product that'd be useful for our customers. And then from there, it, it ballooned from just the bat auto identification into 
um, trying to address the, you know, almost half of our customers are more, uh, I'll call them non backs If I say bird customers, that will insult the herpetologists and such. So <laughs> non back customers, um, a way for them to analyze the recordings. That's what the cluster analysis um, was, was designed for. And we actually use that to develop a app in the United States called Song Sleuth that identifies bird songs from, um, from recordings. And I wouldn't call it a commercial success. At this point, we sort of like Cut our, we have a weird way of cutting our losses at Wildlife Acoustics. Um, it wasn't making money, so we made it free. <laughs> I don't know why that made sense, but for some reason it made sense to us. To, to uh, tell you the truth, though, because you, you you say it's not a success, and, and okay, maybe like financially it's not a success. This is the good cop, like, bad cop routine. Yeah, yeah. So, so I use it. So, okay, don't get many North American birds here, but I use it as a way of recording acoustic noises because it's got a, so it's got a sonogram which kind of scrolls across the screen but it's got a record button. And if you hit that record button, it records the previous X, like up to five seconds in time. Okay. So, yeah. so you're out in the field and something goes, ah, you can press the button and you've got yeah. that, ah, and they go, oh, it stopped making that noise and stop it. And then you've got that perfect recording as opposed yeah. to going out and going, I'm going to have to record constantly in case something goes, ah, you know, yeah. so yeah. Um, I do other impressions apart from buzzards, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, that was a buzzard. That was a I guess I'd rather ask you to do it or not to do it. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I quite like it because it has that feature. I use it all the time. I use, yeah, it. I use it all the time as well. It's actually we. It is available in England um, by Paul's request. We only had it. We had it available worldwide, but then we get like all these negative reviews of like, you don't even cover my Romanian birds. Yeah. So we yeah. made it only North American, <laughs> and that not. No offense to any Romanians. And then um, uh, and it's now available in the UK as well um, from Paul's insistence um, and actually coming soon um, also from, not from Paul's insistence, but it only makes sense if you're going to make it available in the UK is right now, after you record a bird, it tries to ID that bird. It insists on IDing that bird. Yeah. And obviously you have um, what Canada goose, and, you know, there's only so many North American birds that's going to ID. So uh, coming soon um, by Paul's specific request is turn off the auto ID. I just want to use the spectrogram yeah. app. <laughs> you know, to be frank, that we stole the previously discussed ad nauseum spectrogram zooming and et cetera from the Echometer Touch. So um, I don't want to say how many blood, sweat, tears, hours, and dollars went into that spectrogram, but it is free and it's it's really it's a beautiful spectrogram, if I do say so myself. Yes, yeah. it's, it's really useful. And it's quite nice. If you're doing other stuff apart from bats, then it's quite it's quite nice to do. And if you go down the birding route, oh, God, that's a rabbit hole. But yeah. you're, you're delving yeah. down. It's... <laughs> Careful. <laughs> no, absolutely. Absolutely. Got to just pop back to the pop back to the PowerPoint. Um, right. We've talked a bit about this already, product development and the, the idea that comes into somebody's head or the conversation that sparks the idea. Um, yeah, I mean, what, what, what is this a design for? Okay, I feel as if I should know what this is, but this is what they're saying. Yeah, there's a reason why you don't. Um, yeah, okay. Yeah, I, I, I can speak to how, you know, um, our first bat detector was the SM2 bat. It was yeah. kind of the SM2 turned into a bat recorder. So for the next generation, the SM3, we wanted to, you know, design a specific bat recorder. We were designing our own enclosure for the first time. We were a little green. We hired a, a really talented designer who did work such as you see to the left. Um, and then, you know, we, we were like, oh my God, it's beautiful. Yeah, I want to hang that on my wall. And then, um, you know, you take it to a mechanical engineer and pretty soon you get a box in the mail and it doesn't look anything like that at all. Um, yeah, there you go. Bot bottom right <laughs> is what you get in the mail. Right, and yeah. it's like eight pounds. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. you know, when, when pa package is a product, bottom left, um, you can see what kind of the real world forced design changes um, were incurred. But also to be frank, like, you know, the first time we took it out of the box, we were like, oh, this is, this is like exercise. This is, you know, there, we have customers <laughs> that absolutely love this thing. They, they, um, they did not like it when we moved to the SM4, which was um, again, our own designed enclosure, but 
we did not hire a beautiful artist um, to make the drawings. It was like we did it ourselves, just pure function, um, nothing but function, let the uh, form follow the function. And so it was much smaller, much lighter. Um, there, there are those that prefer this SM3, literally, because, you know, here in America, bulletproof isn't just like a metaphor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's like a, an actual thing that you sometimes need. So yeah, um, yeah. There were See, I, got, I got one of these shot at in Doncaster. So right. okay. um, at the top of a tree, it was only with a pellet gun, but it was just got these little like marks. I thought, like, oh, mine's been shot. And I, I, I just brushed it. it was, oh, it's all come off. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> So the, the, the way that like, you know, by the time that bottom right thing comes, if you're like, um, our reaction to that was it's heavier than we wanted it to be. It's bigger than we wanted it to be. You know, looking at things in the middle there, you have a, a song meter mini in, in um, SolidWorks uh, CAD program. We looked at the SM3 in this CAD program. It's just, it's different when you hold something in your hand, but you have to be very careful. And we've learned lessons. Um, by the time you hold it in your hand, you've invested a great deal of money yeah. Um, in uh, many, many zeros in the dollar yeah. signs behind the mold that makes yeah. it. So it's almost too late, really, to do anything other than say, hmm, this is heavier than we planned on it. And it's why, if you look at the kind of length in the field before the next generation came along, the SM3 is on the shorter side. It was like not that long after that, we're like, I guess we should probably start working on the SM4 that doesn't weigh however many pounds that was. So um, that we, we, <laughs> you know, took solid pieces of plastic and had it machined so that we could actually hold the enclosure in our hands and play with it and that kind of stuff. So, you know, we, we've learned quite a bit in the past 12 years we've been making the bat recorders where um, you continue to learn things, but it becomes a more and more kind of fine grained thing where after not very many years, you can kind of roll your eyes at yourself about some decisions you made or some naivety that allowed a thing to be different than you planned it on being. And I also learned, um, you know, our customers really don't care nearly as much if it looks like something from a cool science fiction movie as if it does its job and it does it well and it does it at a good at a good cost. So yeah. we're all about form over function at Wildlife Acoustics now. Yeah. Did I say form over function? Function. Yeah. Okay. Can you can you actually edit that in um, kaleidoscope <laughs> function? <laughs> you just play it slower. Yeah. <laughs> We know what you meant. We know what you meant. Yeah. So uh, I mean, and, and I think this is I think this is the real important point that you've made there, and I think we alluded to it earlier on as well. By the time somebody like me comes up to a counter at a back conference and hands over two hundred pounds or five hundred pounds or whatever it is for a device, you know, as you say, many, many, well probably tens of thousands of dollars have gone in to uh, getting that device to a point where it actually becomes something that somebody like me can have in their hands to use. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I wish it was appropriate me for to use dollar values just for the, um, the sake of, of argument and point making, but it is, it is an absorbent amount of money. Yeah. Um, not just in terms of the time and the, the employees, but, you know, every every one of the prototypes costs money. The actual molds are um, people would be very surprised how much money they cost. And then yeah. there's also the sort of um, I don't know what word to put on this, but the uh, the payback period by design, where um, if we wanted to sell an Echometer Touch, we could have put like a five hundred thousand dollar price tag on it, and then we just kind of needed one person to buy it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Or we could have put a $1 price tag on it and then hoped that like all the 7 billion people in the world suddenly become interested in bat detecting. Yeah. So yeah. you kind of pick this point where, um, you know, in US dollars, we priced the Echometer Touch 2. The non-pro was 179. The pro was 349. Those prices might translate roughly to pounds in the UK. Um, and it took, um, and people, some people, um, were very excited by that price. People that had spent a lot more money on bat detectors. Um, other people that were younger and had not already spent $2,000 on a bat detector were like, but this little plastic thing is $349. Like I buy little things out. This mouse is only $49. It's got all these moving parts and stuff. And so you find yourself explaining economies of scale, but to put it 
in terms that don't involve dollar amounts, um, it was a good seller, the Equimeter Touch. It continues to be, and it took years to break even. Um, not yeah. a yeah. year, but years. And, yeah. and we stuck with that price. And, um, you know, we knew what we were doing. That was an intentional setting of, of uh, hoping that our projections about sales would eventually make money because there will not, you know, we're, we have things in the works for that market segment and we wouldn't have things in the works if the products didn't make money. That's just not how it, yeah. not how it works. I mean, one of, one of the other things, especially with the Ecometer Touch was convincing people that um, it was a professional grade piece of kit because oh, yeah. you've got something that you just stick in your phone. So that's just a bit of fun, isn't it? Cause your phone's just like the only professional thing you do on your phone is check emails and, and talk to people and, and that's it. Everything else is just not professional. But in actual fact, it's as good as, if not better than like things in a box, because if you, the more things you put in a box, the more investment in time and Sherwood's time and a whole host of engineers, you've kind of got to sort of put in there. All those little parts, you've got to source and everything else. Um, so it, it becomes difficult to convince people that this is actually a professional grade piece of equipment. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's an interesting point. Sometimes I feel like if we market, if we sold it at $999, um, people would have had a harder time accepting, easier time accepting that it was a professional device. It yeah, was the, yeah. the price point was maybe a leap too far, but it was also like, you know, just keeping things in the wildlife acoustics competitive world. It was going up against the EM3, which was a $999 box that recorded bats and had a little spectrogram and stuff. And it was a conscious decision at wildlife acoustics that some people might want the box. Some people might, we'll just keep selling them both. And Kind of see who wins and we all had our predictions and um the emt eventually it just took the em3 sales down to the point where it didn't make sense to make them anymore there yes. weren't there just weren't that many people choosing to pay three times as much money for you know the microphone wasn't wasn't the same quality you know it didn't make as good of recordings and of course the it did have a spectrogram on it and some buttons to control it but there was no panning and zooming yeah yeah EMT. so not to mention not running kaleidoscope software <laughs> <laughs> excellent yeah yeah okay so uh can, can i ask another question about the the em touch is there is there a challenge at the moment going forward regarding uh, apple and em touches is, is there a misconnect or something what what's what's yeah, what's happening there yeah it's worse than a misconnect it's okay. um um, Apple discontinued the lightning connector that we use okay. um, and they replaced it with various connectors that aren't very suitable for the design. Um, but worse than that, um, it, this gets kind of technical, worse than that, it would create, it would, if we did design for another um, lightning connector, which may or may not work, and then may or may not pass the stringent Apple requirements, it requires us to start all over in the approval process of the product. And getting a product that plugs into an iPhone approved at Apple is an extremely strenuous and expensive undertaking. Um, one which if you fail and they simply reject you and we've been down this path, there's a huge, huge amount of risk. So at this point, it doesn't seem feasible to us. Um, the, the standard version, the non-pro, I never know what to call it, um, EMT2 for Apple is discontinued. And when we run out of lightning connectors, for the pro version, it will also be discontinued. So we do have ideas for how to address people with Apple phones uh, for the future. I can't talk about it and we're pretty, we're pretty inhibited right now in our abilities to, um, you know, the favorite part of my job is in dreaming up and, and working through product development. And right now there's a worldwide chip shortage and um, it slowed things down so that we're working very hard to make sure we have stock of our existing equipment and can maintain the price points and and continue to sell these so it's it's slowed down our development cycle for people that have gotten used to one to two new things from wildlife acoustics every year i'll just tell yeah. you right now that there's no christmas this year okay. um, <laughs> uh, but we that doesn't slow down our ideas and our research and, and development into things to to address that market in a way that is less reliant on on Apple, it's kind of a shame. They they also have a you know they're putting a USB C connector on on several iPads. Um, all actually all the iPads other than the cheapest iPad now have USB C. However, um, it's not just USB C, and you can go buy them, which you can design a product. You 
Apple still will not allow it to be used on their product without their approval process. And they have this, uh, it's called the co-authentication chip. We call it the big brother trip sometimes. And there's a chip that you have to buy and put in the product and it talks to the Apple device to tell it whether Apple has approved the product or not. So it's wow. this, it's this okay. kind of little $7 thing we have to give to Apple for every single product. And all, its job is just to say whether you've been approved or not. So we can't, we can make a USB-C um, Echometer Touch that works on those iPads, um, but we can't legally sell it. So um, we, Apple has us kind of in a corner, to be frank. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. But you've got other ideas. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. We, we, yeah. we have things in the pipeline. There's a lot the of show with doing this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I got to be careful because I have a really big mouth, and um, yeah, well, not and well, I don't, I, I, I don't want, I, I don't, I don't want to encourage you to say. I've got a little that button here which, right. which basically <laughs> which bleeps him out it's, if he swears uh, or mentions. Ian actually things. has a trap door under the chair. He just pulls. I'm like gone. Yeah, but anyway, I think, I think, I think the important thing to get across here is, um. You know, as you know, as an ideas person, as a company that's got a reputation for coming up with new ideas and new products, uh, there's stuff happening, and we just have to be patient and see what comes along next. Yeah, it's, yeah. I mean, it's it's yeah. deeply embedded in our company culture. Um, many of us, and from the boss down, it's just this sort of frenetic pace of irresistible to us to to not innovate and. You you do make um, enemies of some customers if you if you sell them a product, and then next year you make a better product that happens to be yeah. uh, better yeah. and cheaper. It does upset people, and no amount of um, us whining and saying, "But Apple does it every year," and you don't complain about the new iPhone 13. It's yeah. it's sort of I think it was a little bit of a shock when we first came into the market that I think people are starting to get used to it, like. You know, people that buy an SM4 in the back of their mind, I think they think there is definitely a possibility there'll be an SM5 someday or whatever. So it, the, the blowback is getting, um, is being lessened. And I'm glad because it, it all actually kind of hurts a little bit, like personally, because we are people is when you, you put all this effort at, you're like, I have an idea for the next thing and you do it. And then everyone's like, but yeah. I just bought, you know, you just make people mad with this hard, hard work. And so, yeah. Um, yeah, as a company and again, from, you know, Ian's our boss, but he's also, uh, he's the CEO. He's kind of the chief engineer. He's kind of the chief, you know, smart guy. And, um, you know, it's hard to turn a brain off like that. So yeah. the idea is just keep coming. And if, if we have products that, that fund their development, that's how it's going to keep going. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. And uh, yeah, it's going to be exciting to see what, what comes up, what comes along next for, for sure. Um, so talking about the existing products, I think we've, we've talked a lot so far about the M-Touch, the M-Touch Pro. We've mentioned Kaleidoscope. We've got what, Song Meter Mini. We've got Song Meter SM4 Acoustic Recorder. Uh, right, so the SM4 acoustic recorder, that's designed for audible sound, is that correct, as opposed to for bat sound? Yeah, 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 yeah that's um, right. Yeah, and and the song meter mini, uh, that's obviously designed, is that like an SM4, but it's designed for bat sound, or am I being too simplistic well, there, there? There's, yeah. there's kind of two, there's a, a, a mini and there's a mini bat. Right. So, uh, so this is a mini, so it's got one... Yeah microphone but you can unscrew this little screw here and you can put another microphone on it so you can have stereo sound okay the bat uh, i don't have a bat in front of me but the bat's basically just got a, a flat microphone on the top here um which is the there you go which is the ultrasonic microphone yeah and then it has a little screw hole on the other side so you can put a acoustic microphone on the other side okay. so if you're doing bats at night and birds in the morning you can get it to switch between the two Okay. Um, so so that's kind of what it's designed for and and there was a, a basically there were people that, from the song meter two days where you could record um either ultrasonically or um acoustically that wanted that option and this was kind of the answer i suppose to that um that that sort of market but basically the bat one is really designed for bats 
but you might want to do a bit of birding or okay. acousticking. Um, yeah. Whereas the bird one is solely for, well, the, the, the standard one is solely for acoustic recording. And and it's it's really what I've been doing. So I put these things out, I record anything, you know, especially lockdown. Yeah. Um, and as you're recording in stereo, it does sound really nice. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> just, nice. just playing it back, forgetting looking at sonograms, forget all that for a minute. Just just think about I've got a, a, a place that I'd like to record some nice sounds. Actually, recording stereo, you get that really put headphones on, you get some really, really nice sounds. And then the last one is the micro, okay. which is um just acoustic um and uh, has a tiny little microphone here. Um, and it's you know it's tiny. I mean, it doesn't weigh anything. You can put a couple of hundred in your backpack, you know, <coughs> and then just throw them out on a the site. Um, and because they all use an app, it kind of it means you can geolocate them. You can do all those things that you kind of need when you're out in the field. But it doesn't do bats. Okay, so okay. That's the thing to remember is it does not do bats. Yeah, the uh, I, I always forget which it is. Like all succulents are cactus, <coughs> not all cactuses are succulents, or the reverse. The mini bat can record both, but the mini bird can only record the one. This is the worst yeah. analogy I've ever made. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I wish we had thought that. The, the oh. SM4, the, the full size SM4s, you pick your bat or your bird. The yeah. minis, the bird is just a bird. The bat can also do birds, and the micro is is just a bird. Um, the mini and the micros, you pair via Bluetooth with an app to do all the programming. Um, so it's um, the two advantages of that is that it's super intuitive. You know, I have a whole screen to make a beautiful interface that's, um, whereas the SM4, you know, you get four lines of 10, 20 characters each. Um, and it also reduced the size and cost. You don't need as many buttons and a membrane and a screen and all that. So um, there are a minority of people that just don't like this concept and they buy the SM4 just because they want buttons and a screen. And I, yeah. I understand that. Horses for courses, I think you say over there. We yes, say different uh -huh. strokes for different folks over here. Okay. Right. <laughs> okay, I hadn't had that before, but yeah, we definitely say horses for courses. So. But, but the yeah. other thing, I mean, they, they have, um, I mean, there's various guidance for things like bat work all over the world. <clears throat> um, so a lot of countries, they require you to have uh, a cabled microphone uh, in order to record bats. And this kind of came about because of microphones that look a little bit like this. You know, the sound would go into the microphone um, but it would also rebound off the back box and go into the back of the microphone so you get this shadowing with yeah. these sort of like flat microphones like like that it yes. can't it can't go into the back of the box it can only go into that so it doesn't yeah. in effect it doesn't really matter but it's not a cable microphone so sm4 cable microphone fits that protocol it also has a um, external power as well so you know plug it into your wind turbine or whatever you're you're doing and it's going to sit there and record until you filled it can get two terabyte cards now can't you think so I, I, four terabytes of data i think that would be i don't know how much sound analysis that would be yeah that sounds that no, sounds like yeah <laughs> we also paul and i can talk in the um circles about the differences between them and there's it's like kind of an interesting um there's pros and cons. It's not quite as simple as the SM4 is the best one, and then the mini, and then the micro, because the mini bat actually has some tricks up its sleeve. Its big sibling doesn't like being able to record birds at the same time. So to make sense of all of this, there is a comparison chart on on um, on the website. But even so, you know, if you lose your mind, it's what the telephone's for, because it's it's really kind of like understanding someone's use cases to help them narrow down to which is the best one as. I think it, it's easy just to think like, okay, that's the one if money's not an object and but it's not really quite that simple. And I quite like people um, using the same equipment for multiple things. So if, you've, if you're in a research perspective and you're doing bats, but you've got somebody that wants to do, I don't know, um, uh, sort of birds in the daytime, for instance, then why not buy one bit of quick kit between you, which is cheaper yeah. than buying two separate bits of kit, and actually work together on it or something like that. So I, I kind of like, I like recycling data. I mean, from bat world is a bit more difficult, but the bird world is, is a lot easier because if you're recording birds, you're recording other stuff as well. Yes. And you, might, you might just be interested in one species and you've got somebody else that's interested in another and chances are you'll have recorded both of them. So um, I, I quite like the recycling of data. And also that data's there forever. You know, before I yeah. delete it. Um, that data's there forever. So kind of 
reuse it, give it somebody else to do some more work on, and they won't thank you because it's 10 terabytes of data a week. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but there's a woodpecker in there somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sounds good. Sounds good to me. Yeah. Um, no, ex excellent stuff. Excellent stuff. Right. Just going to go back to the screen again. Um, where are we? So, yeah. So, Okay, that's taking us towards the end of the uh, of the interview. Enjoying yourself, Sherwood. Is that all right? Yeah, not been too bad. Sherwood. Oh no, it's a great chat. I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. And a little bit different to maybe what you've done in the past. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, uh, I, I mean, uh, you've given me an excuse to talk shop, and I I thank you for that. This this opportunity doesn't arise that often. I find myself explaining to people I meet what I do for a living or the fact that one can make a living doing that. <laughs> uh, but to, for someone to ask questions about the ins and outs of, of, you know, a good number of hours of the pie chart of my week for the past dozen years, it's maybe even cathartic to discuss it. So I appreciate it. Uh, yeah, no, no, absolutely. And and how about yourself, Paul? I mean, you've, oh, you've, is, you've been on like, here before, but this is a slightly different experience the last time. Oh, last yeah, time you yeah. were doing a presentation. Yeah. yeah, this is great work avoidance, this. I could be doing proper, <laughs> proper stuff. I've got an ES I've got to finish off, which I'm ignoring. So uh, that's been, that's really at the bottom of the pile. And it's, it's what, it's almost about five o'clock. So that'll be, that's the end of my day, basically. So you uh, <laughs> have a.m. here. I have no such excuse. <laughs> I will be expected to make up for the time now. I'm kidding. <laughs> No, it's been wonderful. Thank you so much. No, and, and it's been good. And you know, you know what I find with these things, and um, I'm, I, I really enjoy doing these talking about interviews. Um, I get to talk to a range of different people from a range of different backgrounds, and and I learn so much uh, personally. And I go on the basis that if I'm learning stuff. Um, then people that are watching this, they're also learning and getting a different perspective and getting a wider appreciation of what it's like, whether we're talking about the stuff we're talking about, or we're talking about research or whatever it is, it just gives people a different perspective on what life is really like, um, you know, from, from the other side, so to speak. And mm -hmm. And the other th reason I really enjoy doing it, and you guys have come up trumps, is it's so, there are so many people in our sector, okay, the ecology sector, where people have heard of people's names or heard of business names or heard of products, but they don't actually get any of the personality or anything like that that sits behind it all. And, and I think... Uh, this is a really good way uh, of actually showing people that the, the people that are doing these things are just normal people that like to have a laugh, that don't take themselves too seriously, but really know what they're talking about as well. Um, I would call Sherwood normal. Yeah. yeah. That's <laughs> okay. funny. That's, that's yeah. I, I, I was actually going to insult all the people that weren't here and being like, well, you haven't seen the other ones. <laughs> you turned on me. <laughs> But yeah, but no, but I think I think it's been great, and uh, I've I've enjoyed it, and and for me, um, it, you know, compared to a couple of years ago, now I really do uh, sit and think very very carefully, or at least considerably more carefully than I used to, when somebody produces something, a bit of software, a bit of kit, a book an academic paper, an idea, or whatever it is, uh, I just want to get in behind, in behind the eyes of that person just to kind of get their perspective on why do they do what they do and what turns yeah. them on and all the stuff of it. I've got a question for you, Sherwood, that I was going to ask earlier, and you may be not able to answer the question, or you maybe don't want to answer the question, but you will have had lots of ideas that either didn't get beyond your brain to telling the boss about, or you had ideas where you got so far uh, as the idea, and so far in, you just decided, actually, it's a great idea, but it's just not going to work. Yeah. Well, have, have you got any concept on the best idea that you've ever had that's never going to go anywhere? 
um, for better or worse, <laughs> I think most of our ideas we move forward with, there have been ideas that have come and gone. Uh, my, my, my first wildlife acoustics idea was before I worked for wildlife acoustics, I was working for um, a, a, a program within the Cornell Lab of Ornithology where ironically it was designing whale recorders, not having anything to do with birds, but um, they did have their own homemade um, recorders for audio, but also these um, whale recorders and um, I am a, I don't know what right, I, I think I'll use the word efficient instead of lazy. I am an efficient engineer. And so I heard about Ian and um, at this point it was mostly just Ian and he was cranking out these song meters at this incredible price point. And I looked at like just the build cost of the Cornell like audio recorders was like more. So I was like, well, let's just buy them from this guy in Massachusetts. Which we, we did. And then, then I started looking at the whale recorder and I was like, ah, the, this, this thing is, I mean, just the glass globe was like $2,000. And I was like, we should probably just buy these like um, audio recorders and like shove them in a tube we design. And um, <clears throat> it'll cost like a frat, but you know, there's some, uh, how do I say this nicely? Uh, you know, when you're in a academic environment, there's, there's, um, pride involved and such and I and we're, not, we're Cornell we're not going to buy this guys and so it became a little frustrating for me and I guess Ian smelled the frustration in our phone conversations this is when I was a client and he was selling me recorders and I think he put it succinctly one day where he said so are you going to come work for me or not <laughs> 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 and um, the answer was yes which really makes no sense I mean I, I had a, a job that was you know, at Cornell, you know, and this like this guy was in Massachusetts, and uh, I think I've met him once. Anyway, I don't know if it made a lot of sense, but he hired me and made me um, product manager, which I think I might have had to Google what that was. Yeah. Um, and it turns out it's something I love, and frankly, I think I'm good at. And I don't know exactly why Ian knew either one of those two things, but um, he did. And so immediately after hire, I was like let's do that underwater thing right. you know that's why you hired me right and he's like no 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 we we gotta I have the bat thing and the bat people um they're whining about triggers and la da 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 you've got to figure out how to like you know what what do these people want let's let's get that product like sound you know so i went out and bought a bunch of bat detectors and stuff and started trying to understand that world i'd never thought about bats before to be frank i liked i was like cool a bat but i it's almost as though i thought they were all the same species you know what i mean right. like okay look at yeah. that yeah. So anyway, after all that, eventually I did actually convince them to do the underwater thing and it did go to fruition and it sort of like came and went. It was just a product that was, you know, and, and, you know, I designed the housing and every, you know, I was proud of that housing. It could go to 150 meters. It was made out of PVC and it was an expensive. Um, however, you know, it's just a kind of punishing environment. Then there's this kind of punishing support of like my thing imploded or the batteries leaked in there. It's, it's wow. like a scary environment. And so after a while, it became obvious that the, the whole marine aspect of the business was kind of a distraction. And it was keeping a lot of people's mind share from making the SM4 or making the other things. So yeah. um, we, I, I wasn't against the idea of letting it go, but it was hard to let go because yeah. um, I was kind of proud of that product. It was fun being in the whale business. And so yeah. example not of one that didn't make it, but one that we kind of let go away and yeah. just kind of had to let it go that's fascinating fascinating insight there fascinating thank you for that um i'm afraid be watching i mean uh, i mean these guys they didn't know any of the questions i was going to ask them today and uh, and i did ask that question with a degree of mm, i'm putting the guy in the spot here and um, to see where it goes and that's just fascinating fascinating insight um paul sherwood it has been a total pleasure. I have thoroughly enjoyed doing this. Um, I would love to have either or both of you uh, back on here at some point in the future when you've got more to talk about. So, uh, thanks. Uh, yeah, it's so, good. yeah, absolutely. Enjoyed uh, it too. Happy uh, to come back and deep dive into something old or something new. Yeah, no, absolutely. No, I think that would be fascinating. And I think anybody who's been watching this will have been uh, given, well, as I said earlier, a real interesting perspective on 
your lives and what goes on and the thought process and all the rest of it. Uh, just fascinating stuff. Really, really fascinating stuff. Don't Thanks, for, uh, by the way, Neil, like, yeah. um, I don't think we've, Paul and I have individually and together done lots of podcasts and such. And um, I, I don't think anybody's ever really dived into what makes our twisted brains tick. So <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for caring. No, I, I definitely, I definitely care, Alan. Definitely into knowing what makes your twisted brains tick. That's for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Right, don't go away anywhere. I'm going to stop our technology here, and we'll talk for a couple of minutes after I switch the recording off. Uh, but before I do that, uh, I'm going to say goodbye to everybody at Batability Club. Thank you for watching this. And uh, just before we go, if I just ask Paul and Sherwood to say goodbye as well, and we'll switch the recording off. Yeah. Thanks a lot. See you later. Bye. Thanks.